Welcome to How VR Works, a perceptual point of view. Please welcome your speaker, Oliver Kralos. Guess that's me. All right, well, I hope you have enjoyed your uh, day at the Expo so far. So I want to get right started because I have got a lot of program for you guys. Uh, so you know the title of the talk. Let's get uh, right to it. I um, just want to very briefly mention who I am. Uh, I am a researcher with the <gasps> Deep Breath, UC Davis WM Keck Center for Active Visualization in the Earth Sciences. Say that three times fast. Um, our short handle is Keck Caves. And what we are doing is we are developing and using virtual reality as a scientific instrument. I have been doing that for more than 10 years now. Um, so that's our webpage if you want to check that out. Uh, and then in my spare time, I bloviate online as Doc Ock. That's a long story how that came to be. Uh, I have a blog, and you can also admin on Twitter. Okay, so what I want to talk about today is sort of how virtual reality works from a very fundamental perceptive point of view. I don't want to talk about uh, screen resolution. I don't want to talk about computing power or GPUs, but really how the human perceives VR and uh, how we are, you know, emulating it, why it can go wrong, and what happens when it goes wrong. Now, as I found out today, the Friday at this conference is the pro day, the open public day is tomorrow. My talk is a little bit more geared at the open public, so you're welcome to boo at the end, just hold on to them. Um, all right, let's go right into the fundamentals. How does perception work? How do humans uh, perceive the three-dimensional world around them? So here we have a scenario I'm going to be coming back to all the time during the talk. We have here our VR user, that's Alice, seen from up top, reduced to her most important assets, to eyeballs. And then here we have some object that's a real world object, could be a box, could be a city block, could be a car, could be a kitten. In this case, it's an arrow because I can't draw worth. Uh, also, I should mention that there should be a brain back here, but like I can't draw, I'm just ignoring the brain as well, just pretend it's there. So how do we perceive an object like that arrow there. How do we form a three-dimensional mental model of what we are seeing? It's actually really quite simple. It's very fundamental optics. Uh, light from the object goes towards the eye, enters the eye through the pupil and lens, and then hits the retina, where it gets detected by photosensitive cells, the so-called rods and cones, which then in turn do some processing, which we don't quite know how it works, and then sends the signal to the brain, where the brain somehow based on those retinal impressions from the two eyes, creates a 3D model. How does it work? Oh, by the way, you notice that the arrow here is upside down. Our brains can just deal with that, no problem. So based on these retinal impressions, how does the brain figure out where that arrow is? Well, it's really quite simple. Our brains have learned that light always moves in a straight line. So if the tip of the arrow gets projected onto the retina here, my, my hands are shaky, uh, and then the, no, the light must have come into the pupil, then we know, our brain knows, that the tip of the arrow originally must have been along this line. And for the other eye, the same thing. There's the tip of the arrow here, the light came in from there, so the tip of the arrow must be along this line, and those two lines intersect in exactly one point, and that's exactly where the tip of the arrow is. And the same goes for the bottom of the arrow and any other point on an object. So that is how our brains form a mental model of the environment. And our brains are really, really good at it. It's a very finely tuned system, uh, which is why we are so successful in navigating the three-dimensional world. If your monkey is jumping from tree to tree, you kind of have to be. So how do we do this in VR now? Well, what we do is we just put, bear with me here, we are putting giant screens around our user, and then based on knowing the position of the user's pupils and the object that we now want to draw, we just take those light rays and we extend them backwards through the object until they hit the screen, and then we draw images of our object on the screen. And because now we have two eyes, we obviously have to draw two objects. We have one blue arrow up here for the right eye and a red arrow down here for the left eye. So in other words, we need some kind of stereoscopy screen. Again, just bear with me. And so what happens now? Uh, if we take away the real object, look very closely at what happens to Alice's eyes over here, the impression on the retina when you take the real object away doesn't change at all. It's exactly the same as before. And that's the trick of VR. It's not something you have to do consciously you cannot not do it. There's really no difference between looking at a real object and looking at a virtual representation of that same object because it has exactly the same imprint on the user's retinas. And that's the whole story. So we are done, right? Well, <laughs> not quite. Um, as it turns out, there are difficulties. Um, so I mentioned that in order to do this, we need to know where the user's pupils are, we need to know where the screens are, so we can do this 3D geometry. So what happens now if Alice decides to screw us over and move around in the space? She's not where she used to be, she's now over here, and let's just say we keep the same image on the walls, what happens now? Her brain will do the same calculation as before. Tip of the arrow must be along this line, 
and must be along this line, so it must be right there. In other words, her brain perceives the object now as being here instead of here. So as she is moving, the object is moving with her, and that, of course, cannot be. That will break the illusion. And if she moves down here, same thing happens. The object is moving around with her. But if you do it properly now, and we have head tracking, and this is why we need head tracking, then we know now where she is, and we can update all of these projections and drawings we are doing based on her new position, and then, as it turns out, it works perfectly fine. And if she goes up to where she was before, it works there as well. And you might notice here now that this arrow, or both of these actually, are crossing two different screens. There's a kink in them. And as it turns out, it doesn't matter at all. So this is now really how it works. And I have a little video here that I filmed that shows you how this works in real life. We have a real person, that's Alice, where her name is Anna, but you know, close enough. Uh, and we have, a, we have a virtual globe, and I, now you need to believe me that I filmed this video with a completely box standard video camera. I didn't know do any post-processing. What you're seeing on this video here is exactly what the camera saw when I filmed this. So this is the, uh, the fundamental idea of making VR, uh, of how we perceive VR, and by extension, uh, how a video camera perceives VR. And that's the end of the video. So that's, that's fantastic. That's really all we need to do and all we need to know. But now you're going to say, hey, wait a second. You're going to pull a fast one over us. We don't care about this old school way of doing VR. We care about head-mounted displays. How do those work? And well, good news, everyone. They work exactly the same way. So we have, uh, here we have Alice again. Here we have an object. And now instead of surrounding her with giant screens, we just put tiny screens right in front of her eyes. And then we do the exact same thing. We extend light from the object into the eye, project onto the screens, draw on the screens, and that's it, it works. All right, so we are done now, right? Nah, not quite, of course, I'm lying again. I keep lying to you guys. Um, if you've paid close attention, you might now realize that, that this can never work, right? If I put screens right in front of your eyes, there's no way you can see anything what's on those screens. They are way too close to focus on them. And of course, you are completely correct about that. So we have to take a short little detour uh, through, um, through the human anatomy, and I drew three diagrams of eyes over here looking at objects at three different distances. We have an eye looking at a very close, medium distance, and something that is infinitely far away. And if you look closely, you can see the, the primary difference between these three setups is that the angle of divergence of the incoming light rays at the viewer's eye. If the object is close, the light rays diverge a lot. If it's medium far away, they don't quite diverge. And if it's infinitely far away, those light rays are parallel. So the way that the mammalian eye reacts to this, to these different optical properties, is that it changes the optical power of the eye, of, sorry, of the lens in the eye. There's a muscle around the eye, the ciliary muscle, and when that contracts, it squeezes the lens, it gets thicker, and it, uh, it bends stronger. So here, it is very, the lens is very thick, so it can really bend these rays a lot. Here, not quite so much, and here it's relaxed. But you see, in any of those cases, the light gets bent exactly so much that all the light rays converge on a single point on the retina, which then creates a sharp image. So now, let's apply this knowledge to looking at a screen that's very up close. In this example here, we have the screen that's close, there's light coming from the screen, and as it so happens, the light diverges so much that the lens, even at full contraction, cannot bend those rays enough. They don't converge on a single point, they converge on a little disk, and that's what gives you a blurry image. That is definitely not good, it's actually quite painful. So how can we help the eye bending those rays enough that it can actually make a sharp image, well, it's really simple. We put another lens between the screen and the eye, which bends those rays a little bit, not all the way, but now it's bent them enough that the eye can now relax a little bit and focus them. So that's really the whole the reason why there are lenses and head-mounted displays and why they're so important. But now, from, a, from the viewer's point of view, what do you actually see when you look through the lens at the screen? And uh, as it turns out, our brains evolved before lenses were, were a thing, right? It's quite old. So we don't know anything about lenses. As far as our brains are concerned, light always moves in a straight line, which is why we are fooled by mirrors, for example. So what that means is, using the same trick that I explained earlier, the brain sees that the light rays are coming in at this particular divergence angle, so it assumes that those light rays came from an object that lies at the intersection of all those rays. So if we extend them backwards, they must have come, our brain thinks, from something up here. And if you do that for the entire screen, we are going to get them all coming from here. So what we're looking at here is uh, when we're looking through a headset, we are not looking at the real screen, but at a virtual image. This is called a virtual image, optically speaking, of the screen that is at some much farther distance. How far it is depends on the type of HMD. For example, in the, uh, 
uh, Oculus Rift DK2, that distance was about four and a half feet. And I think in the, in the new headsets it's at infinity, but I haven't actually measured that yet, so don't take my word for it. Anyway, if we now combine this knowledge with what we had earlier, we go back to our HMD model. This one here clearly doesn't work. So what we do is we just put lenses in between there, and now those lenses create a virtual image, or two virtual images, I should say, of the screens, and then we do the same thing we did before. We are projecting our object from the pupil onto the virtual screen, and now, finally, everything works as it should. The lenses will take care of the rest of it, and we can now see exactly the way we should be seeing. Well, I lied again. Um, as it turns out, uh, there's a thing we have to take care of. Uh, if our lenses would be ideal lenses, then this would actually be it, right? But it turns out ideal lenses are neither light nor cheap, so we're not using them. Uh, so we have to deal with this. And I want to very briefly go over this, actually. Uh, if you take a nice grid of straight lines like this one and draw it onto your HMD screens and then look through the lens, it's going to look like that. You're going to get this typical distortion. There's two types of distortion. You have geometric distortion, where straight lines turn into curves. And then you have chromatic aberration, where these nice black or white lines split up into the individual primary colors which you would then see as these color fringes, which is also not good. Uh, remember for a moment that blue is on the outside. Do me a favor. So in order to correct for this, we can correct for that, fortunately. What we do is we measure exactly how our lens distorts the image, and then we invert the distortion function, and then we apply it to our image before we show it to the user. So in other words, if you want to show a nice straight grid, what we actually show, oh, by the way, this is called pincushion distortion. I wanted to mention that. We show something that is barrel distorted like this, and where the nice colors are broken up into the primary components, note well that now red is on the outside. And so if you draw this onto the HMD screen and look through the lenses, it's actually going to end up like that, magically. Well, it's not quite magic. So we can account for that. So the reason why I'm talking about this is when you see video of a VR game sometimes, or when you look at a monitor when someone's playing, you are going to see this, because you're seeing the pre-distorted image. So don't think that, oh, VR is not good because everything is distorted. No, if you actually look through the lens, it's going to look just fine. So just bear with me there. Okay, so now we are good, right? Yes, we are. We now have understood how perception works. So now let's look a little bit at, uh, let's look a little bit at the practical aspect. Again, going back to the very beginning of what I was talking about, in order to do this right, we need to know where the screens are and we need to know where the user's eyes are. But if you're actually wearing a head-mounted display, and again, I can't draw, so this is the head-mounted display you're wearing, um, and if you do head tracking, like with the Rift or with the Vive, you're not actually tracking the user's eyes, you're tracking the headset. And by virtue of tracking the headset, you know exactly where the screens and the lenses are because they're hopefully rigidly attached unless you have a cheap Google Cardboard, no dissing intended. Um, but we still don't know where your eyes are because that is sort of a physiological thing that just depends on the shape of your head and on your face. Imagine for a moment, that these two gentlemen here were to put on the same VR headset, and that guy and that guy are definitely going to get a very different impression from wearing the same headset. So we have to somehow account for that. And that is where configuration comes in. Now, configuring a headset, you essentially have to put into the software where your eyes are in relation to the screen when you put it on. That's, of course, a little bit hard. Once you put it on, you can't jam a ruler in there. So to make it a bit simpler, practically we've broken it down to two parameters that are kind of okay to measure. So the first one is, how, what is the distance between your eye and the lens? Are the, lens, are the eyes very close like here, or are they farther away like that? And the distance from the front of the eye to the front of the lens, we call eye relief. You all heard of that again, boo at the end. Um, and then the other parameter is how narrow set the eyes are. Are they far apart like here, or are they close to each other like here? And that is what we call the interpupillary distance, or IPD, which is uh, something that you all have heard of, of course. So what, I'm, what my point here is, uh, if you're using a headset yourself, you want to put those parameters in as well as you can measure them. Uh, you want to measure your IPD, and here's a shameless plug. I wrote an article about that a while ago. Here's how you measure your IPD. You only need a ruler and a mirror, and then you're good to go. So check that out if you want to, uh, but let's go back on topic. And sorry, I wanted to say one more thing, especially if you want to put a headset on someone else, it is really important to configure it for them first. And if you don't do it right, we are now going to apply the stuff we've learned about perception to see what actually goes wrong when you don't do this. So let's assume that Alice uh, invited over her friend Bob, uh, and Bob now put the headset on, and as it so happens, Bob's eyes are more narrow set than Alice's. So these are Bob's eyes, and then this shadowy thing in the back, that is where Alice's eyes would be if she were wearing the headset. Uh, so now we have again here an object, here are the virtual screens. 
but now because Alice didn't configure the headset for Bob, it is still creating the image based on her interpupillary distance. So she, uh, it's doing what we've discussed before. It's projecting out the rays from her eye position onto the screen and drawing it like this. But now, of course, Bob is actually the one watching this. So he is now going to see the light coming into his eyes along these rays. And then by using the perception method, he will perceive that this virtual object is now here instead of here. So it, in other words, the whole world around Bob has shifted from where it's intended to be. Generally speaking, if your IPD is configured bigger than it actually is, everything will appear too small. If you look down at the floor, the floor might be hovering about your knees. And if your IPD is configured too small, everything will appear too big. There's a bit more to it, but that's the gist of it. So the point is that it's really important uh, to do this right. Oop, that's not my computer. Um, OK, so now we, have, now we are good, right? That's all we need to know. No, unfortunately not. There's one other thing that we have to talk about very briefly, and that is the so-called pupil swim. Even if you do configure everything correctly and you put in your IPD and you somehow magically measure your eye relief, you still have an issue. And that's the following. In all the examples I've run so far, uh, I've always had the user staring straight ahead. But what actually is happening, users might be looking around inside the headset, not just by moving the head, but by moving their eyes. And when you move your eyes, you move your pupils, but the computer doesn't know that. So what happens now? If Alice looks over to the left, her pupils shift, and as you can see, the virtual object shifts in response. And if she looks to the right, it shifts as well. And this is this slight deviation between what you perceive and where things should be uh, is, is, called, uh, is called pupil swim. And that's also not really a good thing, but there's really not very much we can do about it unless the computer were to somehow track your eyes and know where they are. Okay, so now let's put everything together. In order to create a convincing and not bad uh, VR system, we have to combine all of these things. We need good screens and lenses, didn't even talk about that. We need good internal calibration. We need to know where the screens, where the lenses are. Uh, we need high precision head tracking. We need to know where the headset is so we can, com uh, we can compute the image correctly. We need good user calibration, um, meaning that you have to put in your IPD and all that. And ideally, we would need eye tracking where we can dynamically follow your eyes and we can automatically configure all of these things. Uh, and then there's one additional thing, of course, that we haven't talked about, and that is we also need low end-to-end -end latency, uh, so-called motion-to-photon latency, the time it takes between you making a movement and the tracking system picking that up uh, and the software updating its state, redrawing the image, sending it to the screen, and then the screen actually showing it to you. So since we haven't talked about that yet, let's see what happens when you don't have low latency. It should be like less than 16 milliseconds at least. Um, here we have Alice again, she's looking at an object, and let's just say she is wearing a headset with a very bad end-to-end -end latency of 60 milliseconds, just to throw out the number. But right now everything is fine. She's looking at an object, it's drawn, she's perceiving it exactly where it should be. But now she whips her head around like this, very quickly, and let's say from there to here takes 10 milliseconds. Now in that time, the system can't have reacted to a change yet, so what it means is it will not update the image on the screen, so the virtual object that she's perceiving is moving with her, and it's going to stay there, for the next 50 milliseconds until the system catches up and then updates the image on the screen and puts it back where it is. And that, as you can imagine, is obviously bad. What happens is that if you, look, if you look around or if you move around, the entire environment will appear to swim around you. So now let's talk about what actually happens uh, uh, when anything of these things go wrong, when latency is too high, calibration is bad and whatnot. In all of these cases, what is happening is that the virtual objects do not appear to be stable. They swim around, they wobble, they deform, they warp. And as it turns out, that can cause simulator sickness, which is very bad. We don't want that. Uh, the actual mechanism, how it causes it, is not 100% understood. My favorite hypothesis is the poisoning one, where your body thinks you're poisoned like you had much to drink and the room swims, and then the body purges to get rid of the poison. Kind of seems to match symptom-wise, but there are some indications that might not be how it really works. But anyway, it's a really, really bad thing, and we don't want that, as everybody has said today. Now, what I want to point out, that all of these issues that we have talked about so far are intrinsic to VR. If you want to do VR, no matter what kind of VR you want to do, even if you only want to show an empty room, you have to get all of those right to not make your user sick. But the good news is they're also basically solved, or we know how to solve them. Uh, the systems are good enough, they're fast enough, the optics are good enough, and so forth, so that if you put on a headset and put yourself into a static scene, for the vast majority of people, there will be no discomfort. So that's a, that's a really good thing. But of course, there's a caveat, there's, an, uh, there's a but. Can something else go wrong? And this is a huge topic that I'm not going to address today because that's a talk unto itself, and that is artificial locomotion, which 
the guys in the panel before us have already talked about, where you force the user through the environment, which causes a disconnect between seen motion and felt motion. Again, it's a talk unto itself. Uh, here's another shameless plug. I did that exact talk a while ago, so if you want to check it out and have 40 minutes to kill, just go to that uh, YouTube video and, uh, and watch that. All right, now we are done, huh? Now, of course not, there's one more thing. Um, remember that uh, slide I showed you about accommodation, how the eye adapts to different distances, keep that in mind. Remember how I, at the very beginning of the talk I said that the impression on the retina from a real object is exactly the same as one from a virtual object? Blatant lies. That there's a difference there. And so this difference is, uh, is very fundamental. It is the so-called accommodation virgins conflict, and it's a big deal, which is why I have to bring it up here. What is happening there? Let's go back to Alice, and let's get back to her headset, and now we have two small objects in the space. We have one that is here, and one that is here. So now one physiological thing that is going on with humans is when we look at an object, we focus our eyes on it. We want to turn our eyes, let's just say Alice is gonna focus on this object back here, She's gonna turn her eyes so that the light from the object hits her retina exactly in the middle. We are doing that because that's a so-called fovea. That's where the eyes have the highest resolution because it has the highest density of rods and cones. So we always automatically, whenever I look at something, I foveate, sorry about that, I foveate my eyes so that I get the highest resolution picture. Now there's the thing. We also talked about accommodation, how the eye has to adapt to bring object at a certain distance into focus. Now, when you take your smartphone or a camera with an autofocus and you point it at something, you sometimes hear the lens going ee -oo, ee -oo, as it's trying to focus on the object. It can take a while, right? Our eyes are much, much smarter than that. There's this thing called accommodation virgins coupling, which is a learned reflex that we learn when we are very, very young, where the moment you cross your eyes to foveate on an object that's at a certain distance, your lenses immediately accommodate to that distance. It's a coupling between those two. And that's fantastic, works really well, but the problem is in VR it doesn't quite. Imagine now, here everything is fine, right? Alice is uh, looking at this object, she's focusing on it, everything is fine. Now let's see what happens when Alice uh, focuses on, um, on that object down there. She has to cross her eyes a lot to foveate that object in both eyes. Her lenses in her eyes will immediately focus on this distance here, but oh, bummer. As it so happens, the actual light that she sees is coming from that virtual screen because there is no real object, which means that her eyes should be focused on this distance, but they are focused on that, which means the whole thing breaks down. And that is the accommodation virgins conflict that I was talking about. And uh, what does it lead to? Well, first of all, blurry objects. When you're looking at a close-by object and the light comes actually from somewhere else, it's going to be blurry. Now, what comes from that is eye strain. Our eyes really don't like looking at blurry things. Um, so the eye will try to compensate for that and will kind of shift focus back and forth and try to get it in. There's this fight going on, uh, which, causes, uh, which causes eye strain in the short term. And then there's more. If you do this for a long amount of time, let's say a couple of hours, your eyes will actually temporarily unlearn this reflex, that uh, accommodation virgins coupling, they will decouple, which as long as you're in VR is going to be better actually, you're going to see objects sharp, but then when you take the headset off, your vision is all going to be like, whoa, what's going on? So the basic idea here is if you have just spent four hours in your headset, you don't want to be driving a car or operating heavy machinery or doing brain surgery right afterwards. You want to have, let's say, 15 minutes for your eyes to get back where they ought to be. And that leads actually to a larger concern. And I mentioned that, and this is a big one, it's often brought up. I mentioned that we're learning this accommodation virgins coupling at a very, very young age. Uh, and so that is one reason why we shouldn't expose potentially very young children to VR because it might interfere with them learning this reflex. Now, the research indicates that this reflex is set in stone at about two years of age, but you know, at that point you really want to, you want to play it safe, let's just say. You need to lo uh, look for a lot more research. Now, good news is, right now, all VR headsets that are available and AR as well uh, have this problem that they're all focusing on a single distance. But there are potential solutions in the works, and you just have to Google these. One of them is near-eye light field displays, which have multiple focus planes, and then whatever it is that Magic Leap is working on, because nobody honestly knows. Um, but they are saying that they have a multifocal AR display as well. So you want to check that out if you're concerned about this thing. Turns out that uh, this decoupling here is not a huge deal because the eye is pretty uh, uh, elastic, it snaps back, but still, it's something to take into account. Again, I hit the wrong computer, oops. But now, that was really it. So, 